got a lot. Lift them away. Their first game nearly failed. Nothing will go wrong. A year before we shipped Half-Life 1, people in the company looked at what we had and said, this isn't good enough. We made some pretty big mistakes. And their second was stolen right out of their own offices. At the time, it was shocking. That was a, a, a dark day for us uh, at Valve. I had people in the company coming to me and saying, you know, are we going to go out of business? But they took the world of gaming to the next level. It's just amazing now that what we can do, it was more than just a video game. It's more and more possible for more people to look at, at games as not just entertainment, but an art form. This is the amazing story of Valve and Half-Life. Wake up and smell the ashes. In 1996, a software developer at Microsoft named Gabe Newell is struck with a new idea. I got to know the guys at id, and the more I thought about what they were doing and the successes they were having with their distribution models as well as their technology, the more it seemed to me that that would be a lot more fun than working on operating systems. Gabe isn't the only person at Microsoft thinking about getting into gaming. Mike Harrington and myself met while we were working at Microsoft. We were both working in the operating systems group. We both worked with a guy named Michael Abrash, who's pretty famous as a game writer, uh, and who also went over to id. Mike and I started thinking about possibly starting a game company. In 1996, Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington leave Microsoft to form Valve Software in Kirkland, Washington. Valve was really all about controlling the flow of an entertaining experience, having your hand on that knob, deciding when to turn it up, turn it down. That was a compelling metaphor. We signed the LLC agreement the same day uh, that I got married. Uh, I was standing there all dressed up to go off and do my wedding vows, and Mike is frantically shoving papers under my pen so that we can get that taken care of. It certainly makes it easier to remember the company's anniversary and, and my wedding anniversary since they're on the same day. This was a novice game company, and guys from Microsoft who worked with games and worked with software but not put together a game project. Michael Abrash was one of the first people we contacted and said, you know, can you give us advice? Michael Abrash was like, rather than going off and doing your own engine, you should come down to Texas and see what John Carmack and he were working on. Mike and Gabe and a couple other people went down to Texas. They had the, the code on a CD on the plane on the way home. They were just convinced this was the way to go. Valve has an engine. Now they need to figure out what to do with it. We were originally working on two projects simultaneously. One was a first-person action game. The other one was Prospero, which is a very different game. Uh, it was uh, much more of a fantasy epic. That when we had played Doom, there seemed to be sort of two directions. One was this sense of very fast pace sort of a blaster being in a shooting gallery. But uh, Mike and I weren't as good as a lot of the people playing, so our sense of doom was much more like, this is a really scary place, this is a very dangerous place. We're not in a shooting gallery, we're a target in a shooting gallery. And it was that sense of being in this world that we thought was really interesting. Valve ultimately decides to do a first-person shooter called Half-Life. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. Half-Life 1 started with something which was sort of revolutionary at the time, which was we started you off in an ordinary day at work, with no weapons and no sense of peril. You were just a scientist named Gordon Freeman. Morning, Mr. Freeman. Looks like you're running late. It was showing up for a day at work at the Black Mesa Research Facilities. 
Are you supposed to be in the test chamber for an hour of procedures today, Gordon? You started the day involved in an experiment that went badly wrong. Oh, hell literally broke loose. All of a sudden, from mild-mannered scientist, you become a crowbar-wielding savior of the universe. It's a perfect sort of story set up for what then becomes a, a fight for survival. Really, it was just the momentum of Half-Life that caused the production of Prospero to stop. It's not long before Valve realizes the pieces of Half-Life aren't fitting together. About a year before we shipped Half-Life 1, people in the company looked at what we had and said, this isn't good enough. We looked at what we had accomplished so far and realized that we'd made some pretty big mistakes in terms of how we were going to achieve these effects. So we seemed to, at that point, be at a juncture. The team must decide to either ship the game as it is or to throw out everything and start fresh. Oh, my God, we're good! <laughs> That's it. Lip, lip to the right. Oh! Oops. It's about to go critical. Aren't you supposed to be in the test chamber? Half an hour? By 1997, after an entire year spent in development, Valve decides that Half-Life is missing the mark and gives the game a complete redesign. You know, we really believed that the right thing to do was to focus on building something that's really good in spite of the fact that it was going to cost us a lot of time and cost us a lot of money. And also, it's just very stressful to have been working, you know, at that point for a year and say, OK, well, we haven't really gotten as close as we would have hoped by now to the thing that we were wanting to create. The decision has an unexpected effect on the team. So rather than demoralizing everybody, we were dealing with our situation honestly, that we were admitting that things weren't up to par yet, and that they were really glad to see our commitment to building a really good game. Surprisingly, I think that morale actually got better. To get Half-Life done right, Valve adopts a unique approach to game development. So as we design the games here at Valve, a lot of the design teams tend to break off into subgroups known as cabals. Which was a more collaborative process, sort of allowed people to participate in an additive way without having to be hypercritical or argumentative. And it was most productive working through all the details of building the game design. And that was enormously successful. What we ended up doing was build cabals around different pieces of functionality, like Half-Life Multiplayer had its own cabal towards the end. It doesn't take long to get Half-Life back on track. One of the most important things about Half-Life is that we kept a really immersive first-person experience, and we never broke it. We had talked about going away to a third-person camera at times, and we decided that was a bad idea, that we wanted to keep the pressure on for the whole time so that you're in this character and these things are happening to you and we don't let the pressure up. In creating the character of Gordon Freeman, we wanted to do someone who was quite a bit apart from the typical action game hero. We wanted to do a character who was really transparent and every man not your typical action hero. We decided that we wanted to do something that hadn't really been done in a first-person shooter. Gordon, you're alive. Thank God for that hazard suit. And have these characters that were allies that made it more fun to move through the game with. Lead the way. We'd done the scientists and Barney who would talk to you. Let's get the hell out of here. Follow you, and they had some behavior. They would reveal bits of the story as you went through the levels. Don't count on the cavalry finding us down here. Head for the surface. You know, we were really excited at that point that we had made, you know, a character whose mouth could move while they were playing. Destroy the damned thing before it grows any larger. Stop! That ended up being a really good assumption to make. People talked a lot about how much they loved Barney and would drag several Barneys through the game with them and really protect them and not let them get killed. The different thing that Valve did with AI was really just the amount of attention we paid to it. Soon, the gaming world starts paying attention to this new first-person shooter. In 1997, when we went to our first E3, we were 
off the main hall. Initially, people weren't very aware of us. And then the word of mouth started to pick up. Gotten a lot of support and ended up winning, you know, the best action game of the show. Val finally releases Half-Life in November 1998, and it takes the industry by storm. It was more than just a video game. It, it actually was almost like a movie in the way that it played out. Valve was able to do something that had never really been done before with a video game. It mixed science fiction and horror in this really boiled down, intense way. We weren't really expecting anything like the kind of response we got after it was released. Half-Life is named Game of the Year by 50 different publications. It makes $22 million in sales in its first year and will go on to sell 8 million copies worldwide, bringing in more than $100 million. Two best-selling expansion packs are also released for the game. A large part of Half-Life's success is also due to user-created modifications, such as Counter-Strike. The mod phenomenon with Half-Life was a major boon to the entire PC industry. The mod community kept Half-Life at the top of the sales charts for years. No! Get it off me! Get it off! I was really interested in the whole theme of uh, military warfare and terrorism and counter-terrorist units. To me, that just made sense to make a game out of that. As Counter-Strike got more and more popular by about the fourth or fifth beta, we had surpassed Valve's games in terms of player numbers. Counter-Strike will go on to become the most played online game in America. Meanwhile, plans for Half-Life 2 start up right away. Rise and shine, Mr. Rise and shine. Half-Life is a worldwide phenomenon, but Valve Software isn't done yet. Development on Half-Life 2 starts in 1998. There was a meeting early on with the Half-Life 2 team where I said, you don't have to worry about how long it's going to take. You don't have to worry about how much money you're going to spend. The only thing you have to worry about is making it the best game of all time. Here in the art war room, as we call it, the artists went out on location to find a lot of references for Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 will take full advantage of all the latest technological innovations. In Half-Life 2, the technologies in the Source Engine really grew out of our desire to create these things when we were working on Half-Life. And we've really gotten to a point now where we can do pretty much whatever we want to with animation, with modeling, so that the shortcomings that people were working in in the game industry before aren't acceptable anymore. So we're having to hire a lot of people from the film industry. It's just amazing now that what, what we can do. We can have scenes where people animate and respond. Don't drink the water. They put something in it. The player can be any location in the room, and the characters will still play out their scene and oh. animate toward him, gesture at the player, look at the player, follow him. Cover me, Gordon. All the time while revealing bits of the story. This is how it always starts. First the building, then the whole block. We found that we needed to really make much stronger demands on our voice actors and go to some traditional Hollywood actors to get the level of acting that we wanted to have. Are you sure you don't want me to swap out the polarizer? When we started to get these great animators working on the game, we realized how much farther we could bring our acting. The inspiration for our facial animation system was the work of Dr. Paul Ekman. He's a researcher that came up with a catalog of facial movements and the expressions. So we went to his system and came up with a set of 34 different facial muscle groups that we modeled on all of our characters that can then be animated and so that you get very realistic facial expressions and the face is always in motion. The differences between uh, animating for film and for games 
is mainly in, in games, you don't have close-ups and such like that. What a director does when they're blocking out a movie, they're like, this actor needs to move here and deliver this line and look at this other actor. Which in film, you know, you know exactly, you know, what angle you're animating for. And in, in games, you have no idea, especially in for Half-Life 2. It's all an interactive experience. We don't go to cutscenes or anything like that. Our camera is constantly moving because it's the player. It's to get the player to have an emotional reaction, these characters are really like acting out a scene. So all our animations, gestures and movements need to be more broad so that they can read from almost any angle. The same amount of detail that goes into creating the character models also goes into creating the characters' personalities. We found that players really got emotionally attached to our characters, and so we made a huge, huge investment in character acting. Remember when we thought Black Mesa was as bad as it could get? We had to come up with very solid personalities and characterizations for the characters so we could stay with that. I can't take it anymore. We created character profiles for all of the major characters oh, and went through a deep series of questions like about their heritage, where they were born, what their parents were like, their religion, sexual preferences, etc. We'd go through this litany of questions so that we'd really get a pretty good feel for who the character was. And then we tried to find the face that worked with that and then it really gave us a great grounding for casting the voice because we really knew who the person was. Pay attention, Mr. Freeman. While Valve works on making Half-Life 2, the public is kept in the dark. So we kept waiting until they finally were able to show something, showed some, some technology of what they were working on. It's not until E3 2003 that Half-Life is finally revealed to the world. The reaction we got when we first showed uh, Half-Life 2 at E3 was tremendous. Right off the bat, it was like, oh, wow, look at that. People instantly start planning the upgrade of their PCs. It was just great for the whole team to know how much the audience out there was waiting for this game and, and how excited they were with just the pieces that we showed. When we initially announced the game, we also were pretty bold about announcing a release date. Gabe Newell walks into the room, sits down and said, Half-Life 2 is coming out on September 30th. Really? Is it? No, say it ain't so. And we also said, surprise, you haven't heard about it until now and you're going to be able to be playing it in just a few months. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't so, and a year later, it's just about heading out. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and when the game's out, I hope you enjoy it. The anticipation for that one game is just absolutely incredible. Half-Life 2 is a huge hit at E3, and Valve is riding high. But in just a few months, everything will come crashing down. of visual effects that are possible. After a hugely successful E3 showing in 2003. And of course, what tech demo would be complete without a giant pachinko machine? <laughs> Valve promises gamers that Half-Life 2 will be ready in September of that year. But... Thank you very much. But Valve won't make that date. Instead, they will become the victim of one of the biggest hacks in gaming history. One of the biggest challenges we've had in developing Half-Life 2 was the the theft and release of the source code to the game on the internet. Somehow, a, uh, a hacker was able to set up some sort of uh, code recording software on Valve's machines and was able to actually steal the Half-Life 2 source code and then distribute it across the internet. Well, well. At the time, it was shocking. That was a, a, a dark day for us uh, at Valve. We started seeing screenshots of our game show up online and even source code for the game engine itself. I had people in the company coming to me and saying, you know, are we going to go out of business? Still reeling from the break-in, Valve turns to a surprising place for help. The FBI was not giving us warm fuzzies that this issue was going to get resolved. They were like, well, no, almost never, nobody ever gets caught. and. You know, that's just the way it is. We appealed to the gamer community for help with this problem. So we sent out a message saying, look, our stuff has been stolen. We know that you're anxious to play it uh, just as much as we're anxious to release it. This hurts, so we could use all the help we can get 
The response to that was amazing. Tens of thousands of email messages were sent to us with tips about possible sources of the leak or where people were seeing stuff show up online. People were being called in for questioning by the FBI, and the word started to go out that they're closing in on this guy in Germany. And that's when that person in Germany contacted me saying, uh, uh, <laughs> please, uh, I'm not such a bad guy after all. They were arrested and prosecution is ongoing. With the source code theft behind them, Valve goes back to finishing Half-Life 2, from the storyline to the gameplay. You start off the game again, figuring out your whereabouts in the world. Welcome. Welcome to City 17. You're deposited in City 17, which is a mysterious city created out of the ruins of other cities. You're surrounded by a populace that's totally beaten down and is waiting for some reason to strike back, sort of a depressed powder keg. And Gordon Freeman, the usual situation for him is he's a catalyst for change. Half-Life 1 was really known for having pretty advanced AI. And we knew that going forward, we were going to have to make additional investments in the AI. We spent a lot of time thinking about the squad AI and stuff like that. We really had just tons of gameplay. Physics and simulation is ideas. We can put you in a, in a situation where you can use your wits, use your environment to really give you a really rich gameplay experience with lots of freedom. Half-Life 2 will also expand Valve's relationship with the gaming community. One thing's changed a lot going from sort of the old school days of where people were just sort of, here's an engine, see what you can do with it, to today where we have a thing called a software development kit, which we deliberately build and give to mod makers for them to go and build the mods for. Valve also introduces a new content distribution system. Steam is a new type of distribution model that Valve has come up with where you're able to purchase your games completely online. Steam is letting us have a much more direct relationship with our customers. We can use Steam to communicate about our games, deliver updates immediately to a huge number of people. Half-Life 2 is finally released on November 16, 2004. We were terrified that we weren't going to be able to pull it off. And for the people at Valve Software, the game is worth the wait. Ten years from now, people look back at Valve and see a company that really genuinely cared about the games and the people who play games. They didn't cut corners, and yeah, they may have never shipped on time, but they at least lived up to its responsibilities to moving things forward. When people evaluate Half-Life 2, they'll be able to look at it as not just entertainment, but an art form in the way that comic books and movies and books have come into their own as art forms, as well as being entertaining. That's all for now. Thank <laughs> you.